That little ditty was written by a 16th century Italian lute player named Vincenzo. He's arguably the most important musician you've never heard of. Someone who influenced composers as different as Johann Sebastian Bach and Richard Wagner. But part of Vincenzo's importance derives from the fact that, frankly, he was kind of an asshole. Loud, stubborn, opinionated, and he loved picking fights. Especially about one important aspect of music, something that's often overlooked in standard histories. Hmm, tuning. You see, back in the 1500s, people held different theories about how to tune instruments. Most people used a scheme pioneered by Pythagoras, the ancient Greek philosopher. Vincenzo, though, thought the Pythagorean tuning system was garbage, and he wasn't shy about saying so. But the reason Vincenzo was special was that he didn't just complain about Pythagoras, he proved Pythagoras was wrong. And he did so through an almost unheard of innovation. He ran an experiment. And in one of those little pinball moments in history, when someone sets something in motion with no idea of how far the consequences will extend, Vincenzo's experiment ended up undoing a lot more than Pythagoras' theories about music. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that Vincenzo's work helped revolutionize our entire understanding of the cosmos. Hi, I'm Sam Keen, and you're listening to The Disappearing Spoon, a topsy-turvy, sciency history podcast where footnotes become the real story. To be blunt, Pythagoras and his disciples were weirdos. They lived apart from society in a religious cult, and one of their major beliefs was that it was wicked to eat beans. They also refused to stir fires and would never, ever touch a white rooster. Still, Pythagoras and his crew were pretty sharp. They, of course, discovered the Pythagorean theorem about right triangles, that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. One member of the cult also discovered irrational numbers, numbers like pi and the square root of 2. When written as decimals, these numbers never repeat and never terminate. And unlike, say, one-half or four-fifths, you can't express irrational numbers as nice, neat fractions or ratios. That's why they're irrational, without ratio. The discovery of non-ratio numbers horrified Pythagoras. To him, ratios were the very essence of mathematics, and the existence of irrational numbers opened the door to chaos. It was even worse than eating beans. So according to legend, the Pythagoreans ordered the man who discovered irrational numbers to stay silent and never divulge this dreadful secret to outsiders. And when the man divulged the secret anyway, and soon drowned at sea, the Pythagoreans considered this a fitting punishment from the gods. Now, the Pythagoreans also discovered a link between ratios and music. In particular, they discovered that harmonious notes on stringed instruments, like octaves or major fourths and major fifths, involved ratios of whole numbers. To produce an octave, for instance, you plucked two strings, one twice as long as the other. That's a two-to-one ratio. For a major fifth, the ratio of string lengths was three-to-two. And so on with other intervals. Nowadays, we talk about the frequency of those notes. When we hear an octave, the frequency of the two sound waves in the air is a two-to-one ratio. For example, the concert A of orchestral tuning is usually 440 hertz. The A one octave above that is 880 hertz, exactly double. The A one octave below that is 220 hertz, exactly half. Or you can produce a major fifth with a 3 to 2 frequency ratio, and so on. Now, the Pythagoreans didn't know about frequencies, of course. And we're not quite sure how they first linked ratios with harmonies. All we know for sure, as I explained in the bonus episode for subscribers, is that the legend that was passed down from antiquity, involving a blacksmith and some hammers, has to be baloney. 
Regardless, the Pythagoreans did discover the relationship between string length and harmony, that nice need ratios gave pleasing sounds. But the Pythagoreans didn't stop there. To them, these musical notes weren't just pleasing. To them, there was something magical, even mystical, about the fact that human beings found nice need ratios like 2 to 1 or 3 to 2 to be pleasurable. You see, as a mathematical mystic, Pythagoras believed that the universe itself was made of numbers. Numbers were the fabric of reality. So to him, it was no coincidence that we found a 2 to 1 or a 3 to 2 ratio to be pleasing. Those pleasing notes and nice need ratios were glimpses at the very structure of the cosmos. In other words, music wasn't just music to Pythagoreans. It was a chance to apprehend and interact with the building blocks of the universe. Music was a gateway into something much deeper. Now, Pythagoras died around 500 BC, and after the fall of the Roman Empire, his ideas fell into obscurity in Europe, which was overrun with shaggy barbarians. It fell to scholars in the Arab world to preserve and build upon the Greek legacy. Only after a millennium or so did Greek ideas start to trickle back into Europe. This influx of Greek art and science helped kickstart the Italian Renaissance. Galen, Hippocrates, Plato, Aristotle, they were all the rage. As was Pythagoras, whose ideas about pleasing cosmic ratios dominated music theory in the 1500s. There was just one problem, that theory and practice often clashed. Because whenever musicians tuned their instruments according to Pythagorean ideals, it sounded kind of crappy. This problem was so widespread that it gave rise to an old joke about Renaissance musicians, that they spent half their time tuning their instruments, and the other half playing out of tune. Jokes aside, music faced something of a crisis then. Especially with ensembles, the keyboards and strings and singers all sounded like a muddled mess. And Vincenzo, our lute player, ran headlong into this mess in 1563. That year, when he was roughly 40, he traveled to Padua to study with Giuseppe Zarlino, the best musical theorist in all of Italy. This was a busy personal time for Vincenzo as well. He got married around then and fathered a son in 1564. Now, the teacher Zarlino was a die-hard Pythagorean. To him, music was nothing but ratios and more ratios. And he fully subscribed to the theory that, in hearing pleasing notes, we somehow grasped their two-to-oneness and the deep structure of the cosmos. It was a bracing idea for a student. Except, as a lute player himself, Vincenzo could still hear that something was off with Pythagorean tuning. And after moving his family to Florence in the 1570s, Vincenzo started investigating other ancient Greek thinkers, ones who disagreed with Pythagoras. These thinkers argued that musicians should disregard the all-hallowed ratios. Instead, musicians should use their ears to tune instruments. Whatever sounded best was right. Now, Vincenzo didn't know what to believe. After all, relying on the ear alone to tune an instrument would contradict Pythagoras, one of the greatest minds in history. It would also contradict Zarlino, the most revered musical theorist in all of Italy. So after consulting with some scholars in Rome, Vincenzo eventually tried something wild to resolve this conflict. He tried an experiment. Now, I'm not being facetious here. Attempting an experiment was pretty radical then. The ancient Greeks were thinkers, truly great ones. But that's where they stopped. They apprehended the universe through reason alone. And they never sullied themselves by doing something as vulgar as an experiment. That was manual work for common people. But Vincenzo was a common guy, a musician, so he decided to see for himself. His experiments involved tension. As a lute player, he knew that the pitch of a string depended on more than just its length. The pitch also depended on the tension in the string when you tuned it. So he descended into the basement of his house in Florence and began hanging lute strings. Some were brass, some steel, some catgut. His oldest son happened to be living at home then, and almost certainly helped him out. To produce tension, Vincenzo dangled weights from the strings. Some were heavy weights, some were light. Then he plucked the strings under tension, adjusting the weights to find harmonies. According to Pythagorean theory, if you dangled a two-pound weight from one string and a one-pound weight from another identical string, you should produce a perfect octave. 
That's because an octave was 2 to 1, the physical embodiment of a cosmic ratio. So a 2 to 1 ratio in tension had to produce an octave. Well, guess what? Vincenzo and his son determined that the ratio of tensions for an octave wasn't 2 to 1. It was 2 to 1 squared, or 4 to 1. That is, you had to hang a 4-pound weight from one string and a 1-pound weight from the other to produce a perfect octave. Along those same lines, a string length ratio of 3 to 2 gave a perfect fifth. But when it came to weights and tensions, you had to square the numbers. You needed a 9-pound weight and a 4-pound weight to get a fifth. This is one reason why Renaissance music often jangled the ears. Because in tuning instruments, musicians would strive to produce nice, neat, small number ratios for the tensions. But Vincenzo proved that that wouldn't work. With tensions, you needed different ratios, with larger, squared numbers to produce harmonies. Now, to be fair, Pythagoras wasn't totally wrong here. Again, when we hear an octave, the frequency of the two sound waves in the air is a 2 to 1 ratio. But that's not the whole story. Every musical instrument is different, and how each instrument produces the right pitch is complicated. Pitch depends on string length, tension, weight, material, shape, even temperature. Music is surprisingly complex physics. And the idea that an octave will always involve a 2 to 1 ratio of every single variable, in all cases, because that somehow embodies the deep structure of the cosmos, just doesn't hold up. And Vincenzo, the humble lute player, had just proved this. With a single experiment, he toppled 2,000 years of Pythagorean dogma. And make no mistake, Vincenzo knew how important his discovery was. He was not a modest man. And he soon became something of an anti-Pythagorean zealot, attacking the old Greek ideas wherever possible. He also turned on his old teacher, Zarlino, dismissing him as a buffoon and a fool. Above all, Vincenzo said, musicians should rely on their ears alone to tune instruments. In many ways, this approach was uglier and more ad hoc than Pythagorean tuning, since it lacked tidy rules and nice, neat ratios. But boy, did it sound better. Vincenzo eventually wrote up his ideas in two treatises. One was called Dialogue on Ancient and Modern Music. The other was called Discourse Concerning the Work of Mr. Giuseppe Zarlina of Chiaggia. We'll call them the Dialogue and the Discourse for short. Scientific papers didn't really exist back then, so Vincenzo wrote the Dialogue and Discourse as platonic dialogues between teachers and students. During such dialogues, it was considered acceptable, even smart, to ridicule your opponents. And Vincenzo took full advantage of this license in mocking Zarlino. Vincenzo even sarcastically dedicated the discourse to Zarlino, accusing Zarlino of making dumb mistakes in order to draw him out and finally learn some real music theory. Plus, it's as if he's saying, Well, without my old teacher's boneheadedness and mountain of errors, I never would have been spurred to write this. So he deserves credit for that, at least. But however ungentlemanly he was, Vincenzo's ideas about tuning and harmonies proved highly influential over the next few centuries. For instance, he composed a piece based on his new musical theories called the Well-Tempered Lute. A century and a half later, this piece inspired Bach's much more famous song, the well-tempered clavier. Vincenzo also proved influential in opera. He pioneered the recitative, and he introduced new forms of expression. You see, the Pythagoreans had banned certain intervals in music because the ratios involved were too ugly and produced discordant notes. But to Vincenzo, this was nonsense. Even clashing notes had their place, provided that the sound supported the musical story you were telling. In other words, musical notes should serve the narrative and the emotional tenor of the piece, not some abstract math. For instance, listen to Richard Wagner open the second act of his opera Siegfried. The timpanis use what's called the Devil's Tritone, a C and F sharp. 
That interval was basically forbidden before Vincenzo. But to us, it adds a marvelous aura of doom to the opera. In fact, historians have noted that this idea of music serving the story above all was a touchstone for Wagner's vision of so-called total art. In all, Vincenzo was a pivotal figure, someone who shook off the hoary theories of Pythagoras and helped usher in the classical music revolution of the 1600s and the 1700s, all of which is pretty cool. But there's one more aspect to this story, arguably the most important aspect of all. A few times now I've mentioned Vincenzo's son, who probably helped him with his experiments hanging weights from strings. Well, Vincenzo's full name was Vincenzo Galilee, and if that last name sounds familiar, it should, because his son's name was Galileo Galilee. If you ask a historian of science, why was Galileo important, you'll probably get several answers, some of which we'll explore in part two of this episode. But right near the top of the list would be this, that Galileo was the one who showed us that experiments were vital to science. Experiments are how science gains knowledge. For instance, Galileo studied the motion of falling bodies, not by just thinking about them, but by actually rolling balls down ramps. Just as importantly, Galileo gathered data from his experiments and put precise numbers on his findings. He quantified things. That right there is the essence of modern science. Run experiments to test theories, then use math to be precise. And Galileo gets widespread credit for pioneering those ideas. But really, he learned them both from his father. After all, it was Vincenzo who refuted Pythagoras by experimenting with weights and loop strings. And it was Vincenzo who quantified his results, noting that the square of the tensions was the ratio that mattered. Galileo even copied his old man's rhetoric style. Remember Vincenzo's treatises, the discourse and the dialogue? Well, Guess what two of Galileo's most important works were called? The Discourses and Mathematical Demonstrations Relating to Two New Sciences, and the Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. And once again, both works were platonic dialogues between teachers and students, laced with barbs and jabs. Like asshole father, like asshole son. Galileo remains one of the most revered figures in science history, and rightly so few people have impacted the world as much as him. But in honoring Galileo, let's not forget that the methods he used, he learned at the knee of a lowly lute player. Of course, just like Vincenzo toppled Pythagoras, Galileo had his own Greek god to slay, Aristotle. But as we'll see in part two, it wasn't music that Galileo used to do so. It wasn't even science or math. Rather, Galileo's secret weapon in demolishing Aristotle was, of all things, art. To learn more, visit samkeen.com slash podcast. There, you can find more incredible stories from my books, or learn how to book me as a speaker at your school or event. Also, you can ask questions for me to answer on air, or suggest stories for future episodes. Finally, you can learn how to find transcripts, bonus episodes, and signed goodies there by becoming an official supporter. And if you like this podcast, please do your part to keep it alive by becoming a patron through samkeen.com slash podcast. I'm listener supported. Spread the word to others as well, both online and in person. Word of mouth means a lot. Also, subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, or other places and leave a five-star review. Thanks for listening to The Disappearing Spoon.